Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll, uh, we'll get started. I know there was another housing panel before this, so maybe they're going to filter in at some point when they realize they, uh, this is the better panel. Uh, so uh, my name is Oscar Abello, and I'm moderating the panel today uh, on uh, Home Matters, the impact of an affordable place to live. And just by way of int my, introducing myself, I'm a contributing writer for Next City, which is an urban policy planning and design publication. Uh, we've been around since 2003, and I've been on the community development beat for Next City since, uh, two th tw since 2015, uh, writing about some of the organizations up here on stage and some of the organizations uh, represented in the audience, from what I can tell. And um, our panelists, I'm going to ask them to kind of quickly introduce themselves, and then in introducing who you are and where you, and where you, and where you work, could you just say a little bit about the, the kind of the volume of affordable housing, whether you want to say your annual volume or your current portfolio size, just a little bit of a, of a taste of how, how, how deeply you are into this space. Uh, so I'll start over here with uh, Omid Sata. Sure. Uh, I'm Omid Sata, and I'm with Prudential Financial, and I run our impact investing program. Uh, it's about a billion dollar commitment from the company that's invested both in real estate as well as in operating businesses. So what's kind of fun for us being at SOCAP is we straddle, I think, two worlds that don't always talk mm. to each other, uh, which mm. is sort of the real assets world and the, the kind of business venture worlds. And for us on the affordable housing side, I'd say we've made it about uh, 15 to 20% of the portfolio, so about 150 to $200 million invested uh, at any given time. So that's sort of outstanding, and that cycles through every five years or so. So you can think okay. of that uh, over its lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a fairly substantial portion of the portfolio. And for us, I think what's interesting uh, is thinking about sort of how some of the, the tools, the techniques, the logic that's used around affordable housing has relevance both to that sector, but also to the broader community of people who want to be impact investors. Mm -hmm. Because for us, one of the things that's been nice about the sector is that it has some of the data richness, some of the mm -hmm. deal size, the geographic ability to, to locate things mm -hmm. that you don't always get with some of the, the business investments. Okay. Great. Uh, Debbie. Debbie Campbell, Community Housing Capital. We're a CDFI located just outside of Atlanta. And we lend for affordable housing development and preservation. This year we closed a bit over $100 million in activity. And our borrowers are community-based nonprofit developers who are developing housing solutions specifically geared toward the needs of the communities they serve and often have uh, s residence services layered in and are, are looking at proximity to transit and other attributes in the properties they develop that help to make their residents um, more prosperous. Okay. Great, thanks Debbie. I'm Marilyn. I'm Marilyn Rivera with the Community Development Trust. We're in our 19th year. Um, we are a national investor in affordable housing. We do long-term fixed rate mortgages um, to help create affordable housing, and we can also invest equity to preserve the affordable housing. Um, since inception, we've had uh, invested in about $1.4 billion worth of assets. Uh, 44,000 units in about 44 states. Um, so we uh, have, a, have a very wide, um, wide band. We work always with local partners, um, both nonprofits and for-profits, and we're opportunistic. We really look for uh, projects where we feel that we can add value, um, where there may not be uh, that kind of capital that would come in to do what we're doing. Um, and so we are choosy about our partners and always looking toward making positive impact on the, on the residents and their families. And um, we track that carefully to know what those impacts are. Okay. Thanks, Deb, Marilyn. Uh, Michael. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Solomon. Uh, I lead the Community Development Program at Charles Schwab Bank, which I've been doing since 2010. Uh, our, our lending and investment program is driven by the banking regulations, uh, but we're in the middle of a three-year program where we're lending four to five, lending and investing four to five hundred million dollars a year in economic development. A significant portion of it, probably seventy percent, is uh, affordable housing driven uh, and impact uh, on low and moderate income people. So you know, people who really 
uh, need a place to live as, as the driver of their financial security. Um, starting next year, starting in 2019, we'll probably be doubling our program, uh, which is driven by the growth of the bank. Uh, before that, I was at Merrill Lynch. I've been doing this for a long time <laughs> and have lent and invested with all of these folks um, in the past. We're, we're, we invest and lend for impact, uh, and we are willing to be any part of the capital stack. We, we do unsecured lending, we do equity investing, we do um, structured finance, we do innovative structures. I'm sure we'll get into some of those today. Yeah, great. All right, so uh, now that we have a few more folks in the audience, we uh, wanted to do a, a quick survey uh, of everyone who's here. Uh, so uh, could we have folks who have invested in, in affordable housing before? Could you, ra could you raise your hands? Okay. There's about maybe a, a fifth of the audience. So for those who have invested in affordable housing previously, um, have you done it through, if, could you raise your hands if you've done it through uh, individual projects? So a deal here or a deal there, li using LIHTC or some other, his maybe historic tax credits. Who's done the individual projects? All right, not too many. Um, how about uh, through funds? So, you know, whether it's, there's different kinds of mortgage ba mortgage backed securities funds. Okay, so, um, and uh, for for everyone in the audience, uh, we're also interested in, uh, you know, to what extent is community ownership or engagement or participation in in affordable housing development, uh, you know, to what extent is that important to you in terms of the, the your your due diligence as impact investors? assuming you, you all consider yourselves impact investors. So if, raise your hands if you feel like community engagement or ownership is, a, is an important piece of affordable housing for you. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask that question because uh, you know, we have different kinds of investors and different kinds of fund managers up on stage. So um, I wanna ask, start with the fund managers and ask you a little bit, could you say a little bit about your, your model and who your borrowers are, and what makes them particularly unique or special or different? You know, is there anything that that um, your, that makes that sets your borrower network apart from uh, just you know any conventional affordable housing, uh, it, just the whole affordable housing industry? So, community housing capital, as I said, is a CDFI. We have nonprofit tax status. And our borrowers are members of what's known as the NeighborWorks Network. So there are about 240 NeighborWorks organizations across the country. They're chartered by NeighborWorks America, which means that there is an extra layer of due diligence because in order to be a member of the NeighborWorks Network, you have to go through a lengthy and extensive review process. And you're also subjected to regular um, audits and, and reviews of your business. Mm -hmm. our, our borrowers in the network, there are about 140 members of the network who actively engage mm -hmm. in development or preservation of property as, as part of the way that they provide for the housing needs in their communities. Others, others do counseling and those sorts of things, but about 140 that do development. Mm -hmm. And within those 140, it's a really interesting model because what they are charged with are being deeply connected to their communities and understanding the specific housing needs of those communities. So the transactions, the properties that we finance range from transitional housing, um, emergency homeless housing, to senior housing, to... Um, housing for workforce. Mm -hmm. And it is both multifamily and single family rental and for sale. And mm -hmm. remember we're lending to the developers, so this is not this is mm -hmm. not consumer mortgages. Um, we track impact fairly mm -hmm. deeply. Mm -hmm. And our model is that we have financial institutions who uh, provide us with the capital, with the debt capital that we lend. We use our equity to lever that debt, 
and uh, Michael is, is one of our investors. And I, somebody mm -hmm. asked earlier what separated us from the panel before, and, and the thing that immediately struck me is that it's not just about the, the money, not saying that the other panel was, but it didn't come across mm -hmm. in the conversations, that I, one of the things that sets us apart is that we really enjoy thinking deeply together and figuring out mm -hmm. how to best make our resources and our expertise work together, all of us really, to, to get this work done. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a little bit more about the NeighborWorks Network of Organizations. So this is a, a federally supported network of affordable housing developers over, all over the country. And there's a, there are board requirements that are, that are important to community kind of leadership and ownership, as, that, That's as I correct. understand. That's correct. And so uh, NeighborWorks America is congressionally chartered mm -hmm. and receives an appropriation, and a significant portion of that appropriation uh, goes out in the form of grants, capital grants, and operating grants to members mm -hmm. of the NeighborWorks Network. Mm -hmm. And of course, they also have um, many other sources mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. capital and funding that mm -hmm. come into their organizations. Yeah, and is it is it is it fifty percent of the board members must be residents of the neighborhoods where they're building housing? It or varies it? some. Okay. That that is a typical thing to see, but mm -hmm. in the in the very large organizations that have the bigger footprints. Mm -hmm. While there is uh, deep stakeholder engagement, that 50% number doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. hold true. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, Marilyn, uh, may I ask you the same question? You know, tell me a little about your model. Tell us about your model and who, who are your borrowers? What makes them different? Um, we have both nonprofit and for profit borrowers. Um, mm -hmm. Rather than having a network like CHC, um, people, we tend to be opportunistic and people tend to find us. Mm -hmm. um, it's unusual to have long term patient uh, equity to preserve affordable housing. Um, and we have really gotten some traction on that with nonprofit uh, borrowers who are the general partner, mm -hmm. say, in a property that's coming out of compliance for tax credit or a vulnerable property um, that's going to be um, made into uh, to market rate housing and they know about us and know that we can act quickly mm -hmm. um, and would come to us to do that. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the mortgage side, I would say um, we have a lot of repeat borrowers, but we tend to do, if it's a nice juicy eight or $10 million first mortgage in, in San Francisco or New York, there's a lot of lenders who want to do that. We tend to do um, smaller mortgages, maybe something with some hair on it. It's a rad transaction. It's, it's something about it that makes it mm -hmm. a little bit more complex in that mm -hmm. we can you know, take the time and be able to do yeah. that. We can also do long-term fixed rate forward commitments. So if you're building a, a low-income housing tax credit property, you need to know when you close the construction loan what the rate on your permanent mortgage is going to be three years from now when you deliver it, um, and that's a place where where we uh, where we um, compete very well, I think, to be able mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the great things in working with CDT for a long time, which I have, is is to know that we have repeat borrowers, to know that people came mm -hmm. to us. Um, maybe through a, a debt window, and now we're looking at the equity. I mean, if you're okay. as old as I am, you've been in this field for a while, yeah. you see these properties, which, you know, started, it was great when they were built, but now what mm -hmm. are we going to do mm -hmm. to preserve them? Yeah. So. And uh, I'm going to ask you to dig a little bit deeper into how is it you're able to offer equity as part of this finance? It's, it has to do with your structure, yes. your primary structure. This is really cool for affordable housing. Thank you, to have Esther. one of these. So we have all the acronyms. We're a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, but mm -hmm. we elect to be um, taxed as a real estate investment trust. And the, our deepest roots were in a nonprofit, and nonprofit was great. We thought we had a great credit compass, and we were able to do interesting work, but we're really limited by the amount of capital that we had. Um, mm. And uh, in 1998, uh, we had this idea that if we um, created a mission-driven real estate investment trust, that we'd be able to sell stock. 
Um, so mm -hmm. we went out, closed our first uh, raise in uh, 1999. Uh, Prudential mm -hmm. was uh, in our first raise mm -hmm. and has been with us, you know, ever since. We have a lot of people that were with us, and, and mm -hmm. so we've been able to sell stock. We have two common stock raises, and we are just about to close our third preferred mm -hmm. raise. So we mm -hmm. look at the capital stack. We know that we need a lot of, uh, you know, common equity, uh, and then that uh, enhances mm -hmm. the uh, mm -hmm. preferred equity. So we've okay. been able to raise this money and, and put it into the, these properties to okay. ensure long-term affordability. Great. And so, um, we have, we have two investors in each of these organizations up here. So, um, you know, we, we've heard a little bit about their borrowers, we've heard a little bit about their model. Uh, can I ask, um, I don't know if Michael or Omidi want, who wants to go first, um, what about this makes, makes, makes it work for you? you know, mm -hmm. Why is it important for you to work sure. to invest with, through these organizations? Well, there, there are a limited number, but growing number of tools to to uh, create and preserve affordable housing. Mm -hmm. CDFIs are one of the most critical tools we have in order to uh, create impact and increase the, both the amount and quality of affordable housing. CDFIs with whom we lend and invest uh, are uh, a, a linchpin of our program. We have over $300 million uh, out to CDFIs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we work with them both geographically uh, we work with them across the capital stack. We work with them in specific programmatic initiatives. For example, um, we've worked with um, CHC to try to create uh, a program that works on tribal lands. Um, mm -hmm. CDT does a lot of, of, of programmatic initiatives in, that are tailored to what the needs of their lenders and investors are. Uh, and as we move forward, um, it's also where subsidy is. You know, there's a special part of the Treasury Department that provides over $200 million a year in grant funding to CDFIs that can be used as equity uh, for them to go and do higher risk things that banks like us would not be able to get approval to do, but by lending and investing through the CDFI, we can, we can get that money out to where it's really needed the most. So mm -hmm. um, we, we couldn't, we could, banks couldn't work without some of these tools that create mm -hmm. subsidy uh, for the, for, so that the CHCs and the CDTs of the world can go out there and do the higher risk things that we could, couldn't lend indirectly, but through a CDFI, we can, we can do that work and have tremendous mm -hmm. impact. Mm -hmm. so, I can sure. build off a little bit of what Michael's saying. For, for mm -hmm. people who are sort of new to the field, I think this is one of the things that is sometimes sort of confusing, is that in mm -hmm. a large measure, the affordability and affordable housing is set by the various government programs that provide subsidies. Mm -hmm. So it isn't because you've got a CDT or somebody else who mm -hmm. owns the property that the actual affordability levels change, or even really the number of units that change. But what does change radically, depending on who you invest with, are a couple of things. So one, mm -hmm. the way the, the various federal programs are set up, uh, you can actually put different levels of sort of improvements into the property. Mm -hmm. So depending on who owns a property, you can have a lot more resident engagement. You can have a lot more services on site. You have mm -hmm. property managers who really do a lot more to care about their tenant well-being, who bring in social services on site, who create community and do all sorts of other sort of things that have huge impacts actually on livelihood and well-being. Mm -hmm. So when you think about families living in affordability, the affordability is somewhat set by the regulatory regime, but the quality of life differs radically based on who owns it. Mm -hmm. The other variable that I think is at play is that you have an important distinction, I think, between people who buy real estate looking to flip it on a relatively short horizon, mm. who typically will go into existing affordable housing complexes, and all of us living in expensive cities know this phenomenon, put money into kind of a class B property and try to raise rents radically. Mm. The alternative to that is to actually find mission-owned stewards who will own those assets, put in the necessary capital improvements, often get long-term tax abatements and other mm -hmm. benefits to keep it affordable for a long duration. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a huge part of the affordable housing puzzle is that we really can't, the amount of new we can create mm -hmm. is largely fixed. The amount we preserve is often a function of who owns those assets. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's really important to have institutions like CDT. When Marilyn talks about why they're always going back to raise capital, it's because they don't want to sell the properties. So every mm -hmm. time they have to buy a new property, they need to make, raise more and more capital. Uh, for those of us who are sort of looking to invest, though, it's sort of the opposite of a lot of what you see in impact investing, where you're investing in an unproven idea with very uncertain economics. 
Hmm. This is the polar opposite. If you look at the set of preferred stock that CDT sells every year, it produces a reliable and fixed dividend. Even the common equity produces a reliable and growing dividend. It's a, it's a very predictable place to invest. And mm -hmm. for those of us who are looking to have predictable and relatively durable yield, it's a place to have a tremendous amount of impact by just simply having a longer term perspective on capital mm -hmm. and being able to work with great partners who can really improve tenant services. Mm -hmm. And if you're a long-term owner, the, the payback for that is that actually properties that are managed well and have great tenant quality of life, have low turnover, low vacancy, and very little kind of physical maintenance because people take care of the, the complexes and properties. And that all comes back to you as, as returns. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice place for both having predictable returns and a deep alignment between returns and doing right by the occupants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it really works for an insurance company. It sure does. <laughs> uh, in terms of the other things that you mentioned that you bring up, so as, as, a, as, the, as the investor in, 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 the, in funds like these, um, what's your sort of uh, way of interacting and gathering data and trying to make sure that you're holding yourself accountable to your goals? Yeah, so for, for us from sort of, it was interesting, right? Once we sort of recognize that to some extent the affordability of the units and the number of units is somewhat set by the, the financial mechanisms and mm. we could spend hours on that. Mm. <laughs> what we really started to look at as we chose investees was to look at people who were much, who were treating tenants better mm. and looking at people who took tenant livelihood serious, seriously and who looked at sort of reducing sort of the things, if you've read books like Evicted, the, the social costs of sort of high turnover poorly maintained complexes is really pretty horrific. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting, right, is that even, we've actually invested in some turnaround strategies where people take over kind of failing complexes. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible to watch, you know, with the desperate need for affordable housing, when you see a complex that's only 60, 70% occupied, mm -hmm. how, when that happens, right, it means that somebody is really screwed up. Mm -hmm. right? If you go into an affordable housing complex and it's not 99% occupied, someone's doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we really look to sort of bring in managers who know how to turn around complexes mm -hmm. and the radical change in quality of life by both adding, filling the units that are empty, but addressing the underlying conditions is, mm -hmm. is pretty profound. So that's mm -hmm. how we look at investors. Mm -hmm. and, and Debbie, you, you've done some of these deals where you, you've gone into a, a neighborhood where there, there may be some interesting existing owners and you've helped these community-based organizations take over those properties and convert them into something that meets community needs? We have. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not unusual. If, if you look at the kind of endeavors that often exist in neglected communities, you have, um, I, I know the one that you're talking about, where uh, uh, an owner was a, um, a bail bondsman and pretty much owned an entire block and had been renting that block for probably a long period of time. And the houses were falling into disrepair. They were, I would say, everything from single room occupancy up to apartments. And our nonprofit borrower acquired the entire block and worked with, it, the capital stack was really complex, as you could imagine, to do, to do such a large um, parcel of, of gigantic mansion-type single-family homes mm. that had fallen into disrepair in a historic district. And so they were able to renovate all of the properties on the block. They were gorgeous and create um, a, a fairly mixed income street again and offer housing choices that continued to be everything from SROs, in this case, if I recall correctly, into some almost condominium sort of ownership opportunities. Mm. So really create a diversity of housing stock and economic diversity as, as the street was reborn. Mm -hmm. And uh, on, on the totally opposite end of the spectrum, there was a crazy deal in Austin that I, want, I would love Marilyn to talk about. Tell me about, okay. tell us about this. Uh, deal with the Austin City Housing Authority? Uh, we were approached through a partner um, that uh, a subsidiary of uh, the Housing Authority of the City of Austin wanted to buy a market rate property, about 640 units, large property, proximate to jobs, great transportation, maybe seven years old. 
um, and they needed a lot of equity and a big chunk of debt to do it. Um, we loved the property and the idea was that this would be put into a single purpose entity. Um, and because the city of Austin was involved in it, that the, the entity would not pay real estate taxes. All of the savings from that real estate tax that were, mm -hmm. wasn't being paid went to restrict 50% of those units at 80% of area median. Mm. So not quite overnight, but I think within about nine weeks that we you know, heard about the deal and closed the deal and they could put the regulatory framework on it, mm -hmm. 320 units. Um, and it's a beautiful property and it's, mm -hmm. you know, just seems to hit everything. And I really applaud the um, Housing Authority of the City of Austin for being so entrepreneurial for, for seeing this, for seeing the need for the unit. Mm -hmm. um, and our great partner um, who, uh, you know, the woman that introduced us to this transaction to say, you know, we think this is something that a CDT could do. Are you guys flexible enough to do this? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just brag on one transaction that we just closed um, near the Twin Cities. Um, there's a large property there, 440 units, and it's sort of sister property, which had been naturally occurring. Mm -hmm. As Lisa Davis says, there's nothing natural about naturally occurring, but it was just an affordable property. Uh, mm -hmm. It changed hands. The new owner jacked up the rents, and really almost everybody had to leave. Mm -hmm. So there's a very strong nonprofit um, in the Twin Cities area called Aon, and Aon wanted to make a mm -hmm. bid for this large property but needed you know, the equity to be able to act quickly on it. Um, so we were able to close that, preserve 400 and something 40 units. And when we looked at the number of children in that, some 200 uh, preschool age kids and 250 school age kids don't have to move to a new school. And I, I'm probably preaching to the choir here when you talk about the importance of affordable housing. And there's a lot of various studies about health and outcome, but just, you know, having a kitchen table on which to do your homework, you know, can sort of help your performance at school to not being disrupted and, and having to leave. So we were delighted um, to work with Aon in that um, and had some subsidies from the state of Minnesota, but that's another one where having the mm -hmm. equity to act quickly with a great partner who we know can really work with those families and, and get mm -hmm. them whatever they need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, stories like these that Thanks. really show why we funnel a significant portion of, of our lending and investing through the CDFI community. You know, they're the ones who are on the ground in the local communities, hearing what the actual needs of those communities are. And while we, we see trends, so for example, over the last you know, 15 years, there are any number of acronyms. Today, the latest is NOAA, which is the Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing, but we've seen TOD, which is the Transit-Oriented Developments, after the financial crisis, we saw single family uh, home ownership become a critical need and, and, and CDFIs that had always done multifamily turned you know, their attention to single family. Um, today, what we're seeing a lot of um, returning veterans who are either homeless or lost or both, I suspect that in a few years we'll start hearing about transitional housing for folks um, impacted by the opioid crisis. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, we look at them to be, to be on the ground. We don't have branches, the Schwab, out there where mm -hmm. we have, you know, uh, the local community can walk into the branch and say, why aren't you doing this or why aren't you doing that? Um, you know, we, we're out there listening to our communities through our intermediary partners and in, in, in hoping to put out as, as much capital um, that, that we can. We fund studies about what's important, you know, the, veter the veterans crisis, which is just starting to bubble up um, on, on the surface, is not as well known because there have not been as much, there's not been work done around it, but I can assure you that, that you're gonna see a lot more of it. Um, and the intermediary community, uh, particularly a network like CHC, which, you know, they're an intermediary, but they're, they're at a level above the actual local developers that work within the Neighbor Works America network, they've got tentacles everywhere and, and we can go to them and say, hey, we wanna put money here or we wanna put money there, not only geographically, but, but areas of focus that, that we've decided are important to the bank and, and mm -hmm. they, they put it out there. We can leverage tremendous amounts of capital for mm -hmm. these folks. And we'll open it up for audience questions in a minute, but I think Omid, you wanted to add I something? Just, I just wanted to build yeah. off what, what 
Marilyn said, which is that I think one of the things that's really distinctive about affordable housing in the U.S. is that people have been trying to solve these problems now for the better part of 40 or 50 years, if not longer. And so it's a somewhat mature industry. And generally speaking, there's a decent set of federal policies that provide a pretty solid underpinning for a lot of institutions. The problem is those federal programs, while there's generally pretty good bipartisan support for them, there's no support for really expanding them. Mm. And so there's a positive enabling environment, but it's a largely fixed enabling environment at the federal level. And so some of the most exciting things that are going on are where localities like Austin or New York City or other places, the Twin Cities, are really thinking about what can they do in local communities to make this happen. And so whether it's inclusionary zoning, whether it's tax abatements to provide for affordability, this is one of those fields where actually local communities can do a lot. And especially because they're working now at the margin, it's a huge difference between projects that can and mm -hmm. can't happen where you have good localities. And I think what's exciting for people in this room who are advocates or even who are investors is that there are opportunities to really push municipalities and places in which you live to think much more creatively about what tools can be brought to bear on, on solving for some of these affordability issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, and I think, again, these, these models are great because you can trade some of the strength in a lot of the markets that we're all in to provide the affordability, right? So you can give people upzoning, mm -hmm. you can give people infrastructure, you can give people lots of benefits in exchange for the affordability. And that's where I think the next five to 10 years of this field are gonna get really interesting. Mm -hmm. And you know, for investors out there who, who, who are looking to, to do something different, you know, there's, there's a long history. It's, it's very difficult to lose money <laughs> in an environment where the government is subsidizing your investment. Uh, to some degree. You're not going to make a 30 IRR and, and you know, have 25 companies where you're expecting five zeros and, and you hope for a 10x or a 20x, but you're going to be doing a, as much important work as any, as any of those companies are, and you're, you're not going to lose money, and you're going to be able to create impact in your local community. Um, we should be screaming to the rafters about yeah. how, um, how, 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 it's a profitable thing to do in, in you know, for the SOCAP community. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so one more question to the audience before we get, go to them for questions. So, so who here is looking to expand their impact investing to other parts of their portfolio beyond, say, a, a venture capital or a private equity piece? Um, you know, who, who is looking to do impact investing as a fixed income fund of some kind or, you know, uh, or, or, yes, one person? <laughs> we have one. Two, three, okay. Um, I mean, the, the, the interest, I think, in this space has been become really exciting uh, just in the past year. You know, we've had two uh, CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, actually access the bond markets earlier this year. Two, two public bond offerings, uh, LISC, um, they're here. Also, their investment bank is also here. Morgan Stanley, uh, and then Reinvestment Fund worked with Back Bank of America Merrill Lynch on their offering. Uh, those are uh, both investment grade bond offerings uh, on terms as short as five years and as long as 20 years. Um, so there, in this other parts, on these other parts of the, of the, of the, of the capital world are, are starting to see and, and have opportunities to invest in this kind of work. And I think they need it, right? If you're an insurance company, you've got like your, there's a, there's a, there's a model that you have and this just works for you. Yeah. yeah. So um, audience, any questions from the audience? We have a mic that's gonna come around. So I think we do, but we did at some point. <laughs> right. Yeah. Nice. 
certainly there is more caution when you hear about some of the things that, that um, are, are potentially out there from folks who are being put there to, not, to, to end it. You know, um, having said that, I, I, I think that, you know, as I said earlier, there is significant support for these things um, across the aisle. Uh, and uh, nobody is going to be diminishing the funding to such a degree that um, it's going to fall apart, you know. Uh, for Project Base Section 8, for example, so that's, a, that's for those who may not know, that's actually a set aside for the entire project uh, for affordability instead of the Section 8 voucher system where individuals could just go, you know, walk around. Even if there were cuts, those deals are still going to get funded for the next 10 or 15 years. Maybe it'll affect new things. Um, I would say with the low-income housing tax credit, what you saw, frankly, after the election confirms the view that it's going to be around uh, because immediately, yeah, the market seized up, but immediately the federal government, within four months of the worst financial crisis in our history, in, this, in our lifetimes, um, came in and, and created this, you know, cash for, converted some of the credits to cash. And so, yeah, there's, there's, certain, there's uncertainty. There's always going to be uncertainty. Um, but I think that, the, that, that there is such a need and it's so out there that uh, you're going to see eventually the support stabilize and, and yeah, you got to use more caution, but the investments are there and they always will be. That's my view. Mm -hmm. Any others want to respond? I'd just add that, uh, you know, we have seen dislocation in the, in the low income housing tax credit market and that slowed down a lot. I'd say that we've seen uh, the, an uptick in the last just few weeks with people thinking, okay, it's gonna end up here, that's what my return's gonna be, I'll go ahead and make those investments. But I think it underlines the importance of preserving what we have, that you know, this is an incredibly valuable resource for, for families, for individuals, for people getting started, the affordable housing that we have, and where we're never gonna be able to create our way out of the demand that we have for it, we really need to underline the, um, the preservation of it, and you can do that sometimes without the national forces like we did in, in Austin with the city of Austin understanding that and willing to forego the real estate taxes on those units to preserve those. Right, and here in California, we just passed, finally, you know, there's about $3 billion now that's gonna be coming through mm -hmm. um, to, for, 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 for affordable housing under the, you know, what was just passed. Mm -hmm. It took a long time, but we got there. Yeah. Um, up here? How are you sort of, are you sort of actively looking for opportunities? Are you changing your underwriting standards? Are you, you know, what, what's your thinking on, on that? I, I've got a great Houston example and we're very proud of it. It's a property that we own outright. Usually we're the limited partner, um, but in this one our general partner wanted out. There's no, there's no formal restrictions on that property, but we've asked the manager to keep it affordable, 40% uh, affordable. Um, but about a year and a half ago, we put several million dollars in it, including hurricane glass, redoing all the roofs and the, you know, and, it, and I'm really glad that we did it because that property did really well in, in, through, the, through the hurricane. Um, we've had some other properties that um, were more adversely affected, but I really feel as though that understanding a building's physical needs and, and taking care of those um, when you buy a property or, or can, um, when you acquire the property to be able to make sure that that happens um, is, is vitally important. We have another one in Coney Island, um, which suffered badly under Sandy. Um, residents were stranded on the ninth floor, elderly people with no elevators going up and down. And with a partner, we moved the mechanicals up a floor and a half so that the burner was up there. Um, we did a lot of the um, uh, HVAC systems on it and you know, made it a more resilient property. It's just blocks from the beach. The whole building was, was raised up anyhow, but to put the mechanical system up at least next mm -hmm. time, that's not gonna happen. So 
We usually, when we acquire a property with an equity investment, we, we have a long-term look at what the physical needs assessments will be um, and, and want to ensure that. Um, so that, those are two examples. And in our case, I would say that because our borrowers are community-based nonprofits, they are on the ground and they have a deep understanding of what their community needs. And as mission-based organizations, they're looking far beyond providing a unit of housing. So they're looking at increased energy efficiency. They're looking at proximity to transit. They're looking at how what they do raises the, the opportunities for prosperity of not only their residents, but they're often in underserved communities. So they also look at how what they're doing can, can lever other, as, other assets and other investments into the communities where they work. Mm -hmm. um, could I, uh, in terms of this question, this question has come up a few times and I think it's an important one. And I wanna also link it to another question, which is, uh, so the lo low-income housing tax credit properties, generally speaking, uh, after 30 years, that's when they come up for, you know, either the, the investors will pull out and it'll come out, it'll, will lose that stock of affordable housing after 30 years. Well, when did the, when did the low-income housing tax credit first start come into use? Uh, 1987, 1988, when did it really start ramping up? In the early 90s. So in the next five, 10 years, we're going to have massive opportunities. You know, the, 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 ta the tax credit funded, helped fund the creation of around 3 million units of affordable housing across the country. As those units come up to the end of their compliance periods, periods as, it's, as it's known, um, are there opportunities that you've seen to step in, refinance, and when that refinance happens, oh, we might as well do some kind of climate resilience lending on top of that. Is that something that you guys have seen? Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, right. and frequently, the limited partner who invested in the tax credit mm -hmm. doesn't want to wait for the full compliance. They want out year 14, 15. Huh. So when we buy properties at that time, we do a full physical needs assessment. They don't often need a, a full you know, gut rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. They may be ready for a 4% or a 9% credit. But yeah, that's a time to look to do that. And we. I think that we are long-term holders, but the idea is that at a certain point, a building, you know, we have the first equity property we ever invested in, uh, but at some point that building's gonna need more rehabilitation than mm -hmm. even our you know, good management um, uh, has done and, and we've reserved for. At that time, it would make sense for us to take our fair market value out um, and to have a new limited partner that will resyndicate that property and do a, yeah. a full rehab. So. Mm -hmm. But we, we think about that all the time, you know, mm -hmm. how, how long those buildings are going to be in good enough shape and, mm -hmm. and what we can do to maintain them. Okay. But to your point, I mean, I think socially this is a big challenge, right, is that mm -hmm. the credits that get used to essentially re, you know, called re-syndicate the affordability, mm -hmm. so extend it another 30 years, are credits that don't go into something else. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking at this on sort of a macro level, we are at a place where we do need either increased funding or mm -hmm. other mechanisms to promote affordability. Otherwise, we are already have a, a gross insufficiency, and mm -hmm. those problems are only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, go ahead. Oh, here's a microphone behind you. Considering that uh, we're at SOCAP, and there's been so many sessions on um, combining impact investment with hospital funding and all these other creative mm -hmm. funding sources, what is the appetite and what is the most creative way that you have um, helped to make affordable housing happen? Okay. So this one, you can take this one. Sure. One of the things that's really interesting to your question is that uh, you know, some of the Obamacare reforms had actually sort of put a big burden on hospital systems and others to actually care for the well-being of their catchments, have taken actors who never thought about affordable housing into thinking about it uh, as being somewhere they can put capital and actually improve well-being. And so you're starting to see like Kaiser and a few of Dignity Health and a few others invest in mm -hmm. entities like CDT, invest in affordable housing. It is sort of another really creative 
uh, opportunity to bring in new sources of capital, and then people, quite frankly, who on our side, we've been desperate to bring into those complexes. So mm. it'd be great to have primary care facilities and other facilities integrated into some of these complexes. So I think you're, you're right that it's a really mm -hmm. exciting opportunity. You know, creating and preserving affor existing affordable housing, I think are two sides of the same coin. And there are any number of things that happen over a long period of time that can adversely impact that. And, and so when I think about something creative that, that we did in the past, um, it goes all the way back to um, 2001 after September 11th. If you lived in an affordable housing property, you couldn't get insurance for your property or it was 10 times more expensive than, and than, than before September 11th. And so we worked with, with a nonprofit to actually create an insurance company that would provide stable pricing insurance um, to a to these to these properties, um, and it's now a fifteen billion dollar insurance company, um, and it's it, it's not the cheapest, hmm. but it doesn't go up and down. When you think about the variable costs for for managing a property, insurance, you know, labor um, are 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 one of the you know are the main variables, and to have a stable pricing insurance over the long term. Um, this company makes a lot of money too for the owners who are all nonprofit developers who put their projects into this insurance company. Hmm. Um, so, you know, creating and preserving affordable housing, you have to you think of it from a lot. Yeah, have to think of it from a lot of different angles because by doing that, you can you can make it more affordable. Mm -hmm. One thing I would say, Mr. Sir, you mentioned being at SoCap that I think we're not talking about on this panel and not even that much at the conference, but it's a big part of the equation. Is that it's too expensive to build, right? I mean, mm. here at an end of paragraph, and we haven't seen a lot of innovation yet. Really, a brought down discussion that San Francisco is the most notorious property in the country, right? So a huge mm. part of the affordability crisis is that it costs you seven hundred dollars a foot to build something. Mm. It's you know, no amount of creative financing is going to solve for just systematic lack of sort of innovation and scaled models to build things more affordably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but to mm. that point, you know. SoCap is a place for people to think creatively about solving problems. You know, there are ways, there are other ways to do it, and, and people are thinking about those things. So, for example, there's a company out there, which the name escapes me, that takes old shipping containers and stacks them and designs them and attaches them and creates housing out of them. And mm -hmm. these are just the stuff that would get thrown away. Um, and you see some really cool designs. Um, and people can buy them and they're, they're affordable or they, they build a building out of it and, re and, and rent it. Um, that's what we need to be thinking about and that company makes money. Um, so, you know, it's up to you folks too to think about how we can solve this problem in different ways. You guys are the creators of the future or mm -hmm. the present. And I would say, Oscar, that we have struggled across sectors as far as sourcing capital to in, invest in creating and preserving affordable housing. Our, the, the banks get it. The banks are in there in a big way. And while everybody acknowledges the role that having a stable, good place to live that you can afford is fundamental to health, to education, to all of these, these other outcomes, we have really, really struggled to figure out what is it going to take to get some resources that are typically motivated by their care around education or health or these other things to come into housing to help to build that foundation that will make their other strategies have longevity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, I think, I, I, did, I guess we're coming up to the end here, so uh, I'll come with, uh, I, I did have one last question to kind of, um, since, again, since, since we are at SOCAP, as we, what are, uh, either from the investor's perspective or from the, the CDFI's perspective, uh, what are some of the, the, the wacky ideas you have for accessing, in the CDFI's case, accessing other parts of the capital spectrum? or as from the investor's perspective, um, ramping up, you know, like do, do you need, is it, are, 
would having other kinds of investors along for the ride that you're going on, would that, how would that help you? And what kinds of vehicles or mechanisms have you seen where you could engage yeah. others? Well, certainly diversifying the sources of capital. You know, the, the banks are, are heavily regulated and have certain things that they can and can't do. And so there are dimensions of the work that, that we do that their money can't be used for. Mm -hmm. And so money that fills that flexible, that, that flexible niche um, also because of the way that our organization is structured, we use equity to lever debt. And our ability to lever debt and to really scale the response depends on bringing in equity. And it's hard. And so figuring out that equity piece. And then I think that there are also a lot of opportunities around PRIs now that the guidance has been clarified. Mm -hmm. Uh, the stumbling block, in my mind, is, is an elegant entry point, and I go back to um, our multi-bank facility that was led by Morgan Stanley, where a framework was created that all of the banks could agree on, and it, your, your third-party costs dropped, your, your compliance reporting became more efficient and more streamlined, so one of the questions that I grapple with is whether or not that, that same structure and those lessons learned could be applied to create a more elegant and efficient entry point for PRIs. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think we're, we're starting to look at, you mentioned that the, the asset profile of this is actually quite compelling to insurance companies, to pensions, to high net worth individuals, and so we're working with our asset management businesses to sort of look at strategies to commercialize that a little bit more mm. and bring in capital. I think one of the things that's changing for, for big institutional holders is that there are not a lot of places to be able to get kind of predictable returns, especially long dated into the future. Mm. And so I think that's something that could change. And then I think you mentioned something that's also exciting, which is that so much of what we talk about at SoCap, SoCap isn't available to retail investors. Mm -hmm. So there's very little any of us can do with our sort of limited assets. Uh, but I think some of the retail products you mentioned mm -hmm. are really exciting and that there are other examples of stuff that is coming into things that, you know, individuals can invest in through their retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd just like it to see, to be a part of everybody's portfolio, whether you're a mission-related investment from a foundation or um, a family office. This is low risk, high impact, and I think Somehow people think, oh, the government's handling it or whatever, but when you think, where, where do your kid's preschool teacher live? You know, what can they afford to live? And I think that working with partners, and there's many of partners beyond the two of us sitting here at the, at the table, but that as a part of your portfolio, I know that there's higher return things that you could do, you know, betting big on a, on a nascent entrepreneur, that there's very impactful things that you can do with a, a project in, a, in another country, but I feel like this could just be, as, as Omid says, sort of your long-dated bond. I mean, it just pays, it's low risk, but it's great impact, um, and would like to, to see that spread and have more people uh, engage and invest. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's anything wacky that comes to mind, but I, I, what, <laughs> you know, what I would say about SOCAP, you know, so. The, the entrepreneurship around the people who come to so SoCap is, is just tremendous. So for example, think about the things that you do and think about every day. So why can't you crowdfund affordable housing? You know, mm -hmm. you, you crowdfund everything else. Mm -hmm. um, why can't you um, figure out ways to, you know, we talked about climate change, figure out ways to marry some of the things we're doing in the energy sector with housing. You know, we've, we've tried for a long time to put solar you know, to deal with solar, you know, we don't, we're not, we don't know how to do everything. I suspect mm -hmm. that there are people who can figure out a way to do that better than, than, than we've tried. Um, you know, we're hearing about what's going on in Puerto Rico and Elon Musk has said he can, can solve all of their energy problems. Mm -hmm. Well, how are they going to do it? They're going to put in people's homes. Um, so I, I would say, think about the things that you're thinking about every day and how can you apply it to housing? That's mm -hmm. what I would say. Uh, well, one more last chance for an audience question. 
Otherwise, uh, our time is uh, coming to a close. So let me just uh, thank you, our panelists again. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, thank everyone for coming to our, our discussion. Have a great rest of SOCAP.